Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Force has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Late this afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized missile of the flying saucers may soon be solved. Army Air Force officers reported that one of the strange books had been found and inspected sometime last week. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. Bill Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. The Army may be getting to the bottom of all this talk about the so-called flying saucers. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group Headquarters at Roswell, New Mexico, reports that it has received one of the discs which landed on a ranch outside Roswell. The disc landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Grizzell was the man who discovered the problem. Colonel William Blanchard of the Roswell Air Base refuses to give details of what the flying disc looks like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the Arctic was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Rainey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Wright Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Wright Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying choppers to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. In the meantime, General Rainey describes the object as being of flimsy construction, almost like a box of tank. He says that it was so fast that he was unable to determine whether it had a disc form, and he does not indicate its size. Ramey says that so far as can be determined, no one saw the object in the air, and he describes it as being made of some sort of tin toy. Other Army officials say that further information indicates that the object had a diameter of about 20 to 25 feet, and that nothing in the apparent construction indicated any capacity for speed, and that there was no evidence of a power plant. But this also appeared too flimsy to carry a man. Now, back to Taylor Grant in New York. There was important activity within the U.N. Security Council today. Welcome to Ancient Mysteries Revisited, where each week, myself, Bruce Cunningham, and myself, Rodney McGilvery, will be interviewing the finest authors, researchers, archaeologists, and specialists in all areas of the ancient mystery arena. And tonight, or today, or this morning, we've got a special guest that his claim to fame that is not only his claim exactly, is he has written more books on Atlantis than any other author. And he's written many, many other books, magazine articles, and was the editor of Ancient American Magazine for many, many years. And we are very happy to bring in my personal friend and author and researcher, Frank Joseph. How are you doing, Frank? I'm fine now that I'm talking to you at long last. Yes, yes, we had a little bit of technical difficulty in the studio, but we have her all fixed now, and you are on the air. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you, Bruce. You're the world traveler. You're the, the real man that's seen things and knows just what's going on. Yeah, at least, least over in Southeast Asia, eh? Well, that's a big <laughs> chunk of the world. Yeah, for sure. All right, I'll introduce you to my co-host here. Hey, I'm uh, Rodney McGilvery. How are you doing? I'm pretty good, Rodney. It's a pleasure meeting you. You as well. We're stationed here in Fort Wayne, Indiana right now. Where are you at? I'm in southeastern Minnesota, just uh, not too far away from St. Paul. And, you, and you're finally, the frozen tundra is finally melted? Yeah, parts of it anyway. <laughs> yeah, same with us. We're just <laughs> oh getting over gosh. it. Yeah, May 1st was yesterday. That's uh, <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Well, hey, I guess we'll get right into the meat of it. You have been writing books since when? Well, a grammar school, but we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> the nuns had me churn out stuff. Uh, well, I've, I've been writing for a long time. I write for a living. It's a, a full-time occupation for me. 
and mostly my books are about alternative science and alternative history, especially prehistory. And I never thought I would ever write about a subject like we're going to discuss tonight. But um, a number of things uh, conspired for, uh, for that to have happened. So the name of this book is called Military Encounters with Extraterrestrials. And uh, my wife and I, uh, Laura, we, uh, we had some pretty interesting sightings that really took us by surprise. Uh, on the 4th of July, if you can believe it or not, about five years ago, and um, the fireworks were not uh, the only things that were um, seen in the sky that night, that's for sure. And so she suggested that I write uh, a book about uh, UFOs. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not qualified for that. Uh, it's a very interesting subject, and after what we've encountered tonight, I'm a complete believer, a true believer in that. Once you've seen it, uh, it really changes one's life. But she said, well, you know, you write military histories all the time, and history, so why don't you write a military history of the UFO phenomena? So I said, oh, there's probably a thousand books out about that. But as I checked them out, uh, there were none. There were some books, true, that dealt with the military aspects of the unidentified flying object phenomena, but there was no comprehensive history of all of the known military encounters that have taken place over the past hundred years. And so I decided, well, um, I can write something a little bit different perhaps. And uh, so I gathered all my material and I found it interesting, engaging, and disturbing. Um, it got to the point where I was glad when the book was over being uh, finally in production. Hmm. Cause it's, it's rather rather unsettling. The book has a definite beginning, but no ending. It's a, a process which is still going on. Did you have any strange encounters while writing this novel? Um, no, I did not. Uh, if, if, if They could have landed on the roof and I wouldn't have known about it because I was so uh, focused on what I was doing. Uh, but, uh, no, I haven't had repeat uh, encounters, as some people have, as some people have had. But uh, what we saw on that July 4th uh, really uh, changes one's perspective. Before that, I figured, well, all things are possible, you know. Uh, I kept an open mind on it. I wasn't a true believer by any means. I had met responsible people who had seen things. I thought, well, that's possible. But... Um, the encounter that that we had uh, it wasn't anything really that much out of the ordinary although it is if if you never had anything like that before and so that sort of changed our perspective yeah when well, you're talking about respectable researchers i mean we just this week lost our good friend and researcher stanton friedman who we were just both with what was that about within the last five years i think stan was here in fort wayne at that conference Away? Yes, yes. Stan oh. passed away just a few days ago. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm yeah. very sorry to hear that. Yeah, so it's a we, it's a great loss, but I mean, it Stan is. did a lot of work and uh, did some great work and was was just a very very nice man. Yes, he was a very generous man too, and uh, yeah, I believe that he was the best of them all. He he definitely was the one who. Re uncovered the Roswell incident, even though many, many others say they did, it, I'm pretty sure it was Stan in the... It definitely was him. Yes. yes. Yeah, because he investigated it very thoroughly and found out that it was completely factual. So he, uh, he really brought it out to where it is today. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that, and uh, I would like to dedicate uh, this little broadcast as a, as a small uh, memorial. To I, I think he's somewhere in the... Uh, the interim listening to us. Well, hopefully he has better things to do than that. <laughs> well, come on, Frank. <laughs> what could be better? Especially especially at 2 a.m. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for that um, that information. As, as sorrowful as it is, it's, uh, I'm glad you were the first to tell me about it. Yeah, I was, I was shocked because I had just talked to our friend and Vedic researcher Stephen Knapp, and he was so happy he got to meet Stan in the last couple months. And mm -hmm. it was just ironic that it was the day after that that Stan passed away. So just, oh my. you just never know. Yeah, well, he was a total professional, if our listeners are not aware of this. Uh, he was a nuclear physicist, for God's sakes. And for him to have the, the courage to come out uh, as a professional 
and put his stellar reputation on the line uh, by saying that this was a real phenomena, and he brought uh, scientific rigor to this whole phenomena. He was not a theorist. He was an investigator, and he left the theories really mostly to other people, and his presentations were uniformly excellent, and um, he certainly, I think, was the most important of all the UFO investigators that I've ever ever seen. And he will be missed. Absolutely. For sure. All right, back to your new book. You were talking about your incident five years ago, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, uh, what actually, the origins of this book go back much further. It was the incident that we had that 4th of July um, that really pushed me in this direction. However, it was way back in the early 90s uh, that I was in Egypt, of all places, and I was at uh, the Cairo Museum Library, which, as you might imagine, is the greatest library on Egyptology in the world. It has a terrific amount of source materials, and everything is translated into numerous languages, so it's really a researcher's paradise. And I was there, um, I think this was about 1993, I believe that's the year, I was there in October 1993 at the Museum Library in Cairo. It's a huge place, beautiful building made by the British before they left. And uh, I was doing research on something known as the, the Sea Peoples. This was uh, an invasion that the Egyptians underwent about 3,200 years ago. And in the process of doing my research, I came across a papyrus that I had never heard of before, I've never seen before, called the Thule Papyrus. It's named after Alejandro Thule, who was an Egyptian uh, Egyptologist. He found this paper, this papyrus, the original papyrus document, and translated it. This is back in the 1930s. When he translated it, he was so surprised by what he read that he told no one about it, and he didn't share it with his colleagues. No one knew about it. He put it into a trunk and left it there, and it was only till after his death, immediately after his death, when his wife was going through his personal effects, especially all his huge amount of uh, professional papers, which are now at the uh, Cairo Museum, and they form an important part of Egyptology, as it was in the 1930s. And there is the Thule papyrus. The Thule papyrus is not a mythic or a religious text. It is a government document that goes back to the time of Thutmosis III. He was a uh, very powerful pharaoh at a time, this is the late New Kingdom, at a time when Egypt was the great superpower of the world, the leading culture by far. And this document is in the form of a bureaucratic report, actually a court report, hmm. which tells what happened. It gives the specific date, not the, excuse me, not the specific date, the specific month that this took place. This incident was reported without any mention of gods or goddesses or uh, mysterious beings or anything like that. It's a strict military report. It's the earliest military report of its kind in this regard. It tells that on, the mor on a morning in February, this would be around the year 1300 B.C., in other words, about 3,300 years ago. And it reports that a, and, and this is how it has been translated and has been, uh, you, can, you can even go on Wikipedia, which is very critical of things like this, and see that this translation is correct. It's since been translated, so far as I know, by three different Egyptologists, and their translation is all very, very close. Mm. It says that on a morning in February, around 3,300 B.C., a ring of fire, or tra sometimes translated literally as a disk, a circular disk of fire was seen in the skies over the Nile Valley. That it was seen by what probably amounts to 
tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of ancient Egyptians. It flew slowly over the Nile River and disappeared, caused great disturbance amongst the people. It was low, made no sound whatsoever, made no effort to land, and disappeared. Later in the day, towards evening, it returned in the same area in the company of innumerable fellows, as is described. Hmm. Doesn't to say how many. I don't think they knew how many. Dozens, who knows how many. Dozens of other fiery disks. Now, this is not a science fiction story that somebody made up. The Thule papyrus is accepted uh, by Egyptologists as an authentic uh, New Kingdom document. And a, the, the alarm was sounded. Uh, there was great social panic because it looked like an invasion of some kind. Nothing like this. It says in the document, interestingly enough, it says in the document that nothing like this had ever been seen in Egypt before. The pharaoh himself was notified he saw them, this fleet of fiery disks in the sky. The army was called out. He had to call the army out if only to maintain order, although spears and bows and arrows <laughs> wouldn't have done much, I guess, against a fleet of UFOs if they decided to do anything. Nothing happened in regards any kind of confrontation. There was none. This fleet of fiery disks just leisurely flew over the Nile Valley and disappeared. That's all that happened. And that's what the Thule papyrus describes. When I read that, I was absolutely shocked. I'd never heard of anything like that before. But I'm reading the original document translated into English, and there was no commentary by the translator, the Egyptologist translator. I always thought that was very, very strange indeed. When I arrived home, uh, I looked up the Thule papyrus in other, other books about it, and the translations were all pretty much the same. That is the earliest known military document, and that's what it was, a military sighting of extraterrestrials. What else could it possibly have been? And that really begins um, my book. That's the earliest sighting. I found, uh, as I began assembling this material, that it organized itself, strangely enough. I could find absolutely no credible evidence of any UFO encounters other than sightings before World War I, just a little more than 100 years ago. Yes, there were UFO sightings and encounters of various kinds in other cultures, other ancient cultures too, although none so far, as I know, earlier than Egypt. I found no credible, unequivocal documents like that of anything before that sighting in the New Kingdom of Egypt. Hmm. However, there were very credible sightings afterwards in Rome, specifically, Persia, and Greece. Not as dramatic as that one, but nonetheless credible sightings. What? These what? sightings continued even through the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance period, all the way up through the Enlightenment, and as late as the 17th and 18th and 19th hmm. centuries. That's cool. But I didn't find one instance where there was any kind of confrontation or aggression. These, these structures or features or craft, whatever you want to call them, were seen from time to time. But I could find no credible evidence for interaction of any kind until World War I. That is a line in the sand uh, in the history of the UFO phenomenon. Hmm. Before 1916 far as I'm able to determine, there was not a single incidence of hostility or a conflict, engagement of any kind between human beings and whatever these things are or were. 1916, that changed radically. And I was able to get this information thanks to a wonderful British researcher by the name of Nigel Watson, 
and he shared his documents with me about this. That's not been disclosed in the United States so far as I know, which is ironic because these incidents occurred in the United States during 1916. Wow. And uh, if you want, I can pause here, or we can we can go on to something else. No, no. This yeah, is this keep is, going. Yeah, you've got you've got us at the uh, edge of the table listening here. Okay. In January 1916, I don't have the date in front of me. I don't have my book in front of me. There's so many uh, figures and uh, so much information in this book, I, I can't keep it all in my head. Um, but in mid-January 1916, at that time, the United States was a neutral country. World War I had been raging already for almost two years. In the United States was, by that time, the major supplier of munitions to the Western Allies, Britain and France. And in mid-January 1916, a series of major explosions at munitions plants, not across the United States, but mostly from the eastern seaboard into the Midwest, I think as far west as Wisconsin, there was a town called Ashford, Wisconsin, that had a large munitions plant. And then it sort of skipped over to the West Coast, and then Oregon, there were a number of these munitions plants which exploded. Well, people think, well, so what? Munitions plants are dangerous places. They explode all the time, right? Wrong. The munitions plants at this time, in 1916, were a monopoly by the DuPont Company. There was no other munitions uh, organization, company, really, in the United States, really, and even in the mm. world, except the DuPonts. And the DuPonts had an exemplary safety record, unbelievably uh, stellar safety record. They also were major suppliers to both the North and the South during the Civil War in the 1860s. <laughs> and since then, their precautions for safety measures at all their plants uh, made them actually incredibly safe places. There was only between uh, 1870 and 1916, there was only one minor incident at all of the munitions factories, and there were dozens and dozens of them because we, the United States, the DuPonts, were the major suppliers in the world by the early 20th century of munitions bombs and explosives as, as as we still are today <laughs> as we still and it was of course dupont he was uh the um, nobel prize winner for not the nobel prize uh, yes the nobel prize winner because he discovered the use of nitroglycerin which made possible high explosives for the first time for for a dupont plants who explode in that, especially by 1916 was uh, an extraordinary event. Now, just having one go off was amazing. No one was killed or even injured in this explosion, thankfully. But between January 1916 and late into fall, excuse me, early winter 1916, almost all of 1916, one munitions plant after another was blown up exploded dozens of them exploded Jeez. no one was killed in any of these that's wow amazing. that's even more amazing yes now, do you know do you know if there's any uh documentation or any kind of articles that were written at the time that yes, uh, question um one of the great things about researching this whole phenomena is that most of the documents that i came across are not secret at all they're accessible the vast majority of them are accessible to, to our listeners. And our listeners who doubt any of this, all they can do is keyboard a few co uh, a few uh, cogent uh, words into the Internet, and you will find it all. That's what I did. Put in uh, 1916 munitions explosions. Boy, you'll be surprised what you find. And uh, it lists all of them. Yes, made a nice. lot of publicity. And... What's interesting about these explosions, I'm, I'm not just bringing this up because, oh, isn't that weird, these plants blew up. So far as I was able to determine, in the vast majority, perhaps even 
every incident of these dozens of munitions plants that blew up? Strange craft were seen in the sky immediately before and after. And these craft were described often as flying Mexican hats. This is long before the time of UFOs or flying saucers or anything like that at all. But the, these craft were seen in the sky by policemen, by munitions uh, workers themselves, by plant security officers, by people on the street. Dozens of people witnessed these things. And they were reported in the newspapers as these enemy craft. These incidents served to stoke the propaganda at that time to get America involved in World War I. I don't want to be uh, diverge from this too much, but the DuPonts and other major capitalist uh, companies, and they really were capitalists in those days because they were monopolists, yes. they had a huge financial investment made in France and England by extending credit for the purchase of these munitions and other war-related industries. So it was imperative that the Allies win the war so they could pay their <laughs> debts. That's what the war was all about. That's what too many That's, wars are about, it surely it's appears. About, follow the money. But this, is, this was almost transparent. It's not a conspiracy theory at all. And, um, well, to get back to the main thing, <laughs> uh, that's why the munitions factories were so important. And when they started exploding and these strange craft were seen, yes, the newspapers were full of it, and they were all blamed it all on German saboteurs, and that these were secret German uh, uh, aircraft that were blowing up these munitions plants. And it contributed to the hysteria of the time. Yes, let's send our boys over there because the Krauts are destroying our munitions plants. No one in this hysterical frame of mind stopped to think that Kaiser Wilhelm at that time was doing everything conceivable to keep the United States out of war. Naturally enough, he had his hands full fighting the British, the French, and the Russians. He did not want, under any circumstances, the United States involved. And so, therefore, he did everything possible to make sure that relations between the two countries were as friendly as possible, but they weren't friendly because the DuPonts, they needed they, they needed to make their uh, profits and get their money back, their investments. Yeah, and, and surely the DuPonts wouldn't be blowing up their own municipal plants because the amount of money they'd be losing would be even quadruple. That's right. And as far as you, you, you hit the nail on the head, as far as these being German craft, <laughs> this is 1916. We're talking 13 years after the Wright brothers flew the first airplane. Airplanes in those days were nothing more than kites with sewing machine motors yeah, on them. Like the, was it the, the Fulker? I think we have one at our museum here in Fort Wayne, actually. That thing's not capable of, uh, of blowing up uh, an outhouse. You know, I mean, these planes were flimsy. They had a, a range of only a, a hundred or so miles. So Kaiser Bill is not sending any kind of secret craft shaped like Mexican hats <laughs> flying across the Atlantic Ocean. This is long before Lindbergh, too. <laughs> so it's ridiculous. Um, and these craft, too, were seen, and they made either no noise, they're described as being utterly silent, which is a, a description often associated with UFO sightings, or else they made peculiar sounds, more like uh, sirens. Not like the sewing machine type of noises heard by these uh, silly little Rolls Royce engines that they had in those days. After uh, World War One, there was a congressional investigation of these munitions plants because that had been blown up because many millions of dollars, the equivalent today of many billions yeah, of dollars, doubt. of munitions works were destroyed. Amazingly, nobody was killed, as I said. That, the that is the true. That. That is almost as amazing as the rest of the story. That is amazing itself, exactly. Um, what was I about to say? Oh, yeah, uh, the congressional investigation of 1919-1920. Again, all this stuff is on the Internet. I'm and looking some of that up right now, and it seems like that was a major period in U.S. history at the time. 
is showing that some of those explosions established the domestic intelligence agencies of the United States at that point. Hmm. You're absolutely right, because they uh, uh, huge numbers of Germans, just German civilians, even Germans that were born here, were rounded up and arrested, and uh, some of them were tarred and feathered, if you can imagine such a thing. Some were lynched. Uh, this is a shameful part of American history that uh, we don't like to recall, but it gives you an idea some idea of the level of hysteria that gripped the people. They were convinced that uh, German agents were doing this. But the congressional reports of 1919 and 1920 established that there was not a shred of evidence, (laughs) not even uh, any suspicion of evidence that linked foreign saboteurs to these uh, destructions that took place. At the same time, the DuPont Company came out and said, that they must have been saboteurs because uh, our safety procedures were all in place and we were not able to find out why these fires took place, why these explosions happened. So if you combine these munitions explosions with these Mexican hat-type vehicles that were seen in the sky at the time, you're presented with uh, an interesting uh, enigma. If, in fact, these were, as they would appear, uh, craft from someplace else that were literally attacking and blowing up our military infrastructure. The, matter of fact, the Allied military infrastructure. Why were they doing that? What had happened? The year before, 1915, the very first effective bomber was flown by the British. This was the first time that high explosives, the first time on Earth, that high explosives were taken up in a device that could leave the ground. If this was a heavier than aircraft. If, in fact, you had great intelligences that were operating these vehicles from someplace else, they could have seen that it was a small step from this very first primitive bomber that can fly maybe only a couple hundred feet in the air and drop maybe two or three hundred pounds of explosives. A small step from that to launching nuclear weapons into outer space. And just 40 years later, that's exactly what happened. At the end of World War II, the Germans, by inventing the V-2 rocket, the first ballistic missile, for the first time sent a manned object into outer space. And it was suborbital, but it was nonetheless outer space. And that same year, a few months later, the United States perfected and operated the first atomic bomb. World War II ended, and shortly after that, the ballistic missile was married to the atomic bomb. And so all this happened within 40 years. Yeah, within 30 years, actually, if you really do the math from 1916 to 1947, geez. That's right. That's that's correct. And now, in less than 100 years... We have advanced to the point where there are 14 nations in the world today that are equipped with nuclear weapons, and that their nu- combined nuclear arsenal is great enough to, dist- to kill every living creature on the planet several times over if, it, if they were detonated. <laughs> now, Here's a side thought or a side nation. note real quick, because if you think about like the old Hollywood movies back in like the 40s and 50s and 60s about how aliens come to planet Earth to try to stop nuclear war. That that was like the general statement of those old Hollywood movies. Yeah, like the day the Earth stood still. That was the the classic, and I think that was only like 1951. Yeah, and that coincides with what you're saying, how our uh, advancement of nuclear technology was very shortly after the encounter with these UFOs above these ammunition sites. Yeah, it fits a, uh, a coherent image. Now, I don't believe, after having assembled all this information, that the ETs, or whatever you want to call them, I don't know what uh, they really are or where they come from, but I believe that they were not doing this, they were not blowing up these munitions plants to stop the war, 
or to save mankind or anything like that at all. I think that these were uh, the only way that they could make it clear to us, the authorities, that uh, this was not to be uh, pursued because they are concerned that the technology that we are, are rapidly developing will someday, very soon, uh, be out there, be in, in uh, interstellar space. And at that time, given our aggressive history as a uh, predatory species, uh, we will present a real threat uh, to to the galactic <laughs> neighborhood, as Stanton Friedman used to say. Yeah, that Stan was really big on that. Said, yeah, you know, I if I was outside watching the Earth, I, I might not be real happy with what they're doing down here. No, and, and these military confrontations that have been documented uh, have been extremely well documented, sometimes by um, armed forces websites themselves, incredibly. They suggest that um, there has been a kind of low-key war that has been going on pretty well consistency, consistently from 1916 to the present time. It is an unknown war. It is an unspoken war. It, it's, it goes in fits. It stops and starts, and there are long periods involved. There have been losses on either side. Uh, how many how many human beings have been killed altogether? I do not know, but at, at least many dozens, at least dozens. Um, and the, the purpose of this confrontation, I think, is constantly to let the authorities on Earth know that they had better watch themselves, that they, if they want to blow themselves up, if they want to destroy the Earth, that's fine. That's not, nobody's <laughs> business but our own. But when they start pointing their technology, their military technology uh, beyond the earth, that's when the alarm bells go off. Now, do you have any other stories on World War I uh, that are in, in the book? Yes, absolutely. Um, the other stories about World War I uh, were involving an incredible, uh, one of the most incredible stories. I, I came very close not to putting this story in the book at all. I did as much research on it as possible. I couldn't absolutely affirm that it actually took place, but I'm of a mind that it probably did. Uh, and if people want to criticize me for putting that in there, I agree with them. I thought it's, it seems pretty far out. But mm. nonetheless, uh, I think it's credible. I think it probably did take place. And that happened in 1917. This was after the munitions um Start, stopped uh, being blown up. In March, March 17, 1917, one of the most famous warriors of all time, certainly the most famous uh, World War I aces, was Baron Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. And it was his um, custom, even though he was very renowned and a prof total professional in every way, very influential aviator, it was his custom to take uh, brand new pilots in his squadron, cadets, and uh, personally show them the ropes. And he, he would go out usually on a, an early dawn patrol with one or two other of his new uh, men, just to show them how it's done. And on this one instance, he took a cadet by the name of Weisrich. And Lieutenant Weisrich uh, flew with Baron von Richthofen. The two planes took off uh, dawn, pre-dawn hours of March 17, 1917. It was just a, a patrol over the front. There wasn't any enemy aircraft. Uh, it, was, it was just an exercise. And then during the exercise in the early morning, after the sun had come up, early morning hours, a, a rather large uh, silver disc just suddenly appeared in front of them. It just, all this, according to Weisrich, uh, well, I'll mention later on how his story came out. Weisrich said they were, there was nothing to be seen anywhere, and then all of a sudden this thing just sort of materialized in front of them. It didn't seem to fly from anywhere particularly. It was just there. And Baron von Richthofen, being the 
the uh, instinctual killer that he was, I'm the trained killer, well, he had over 80 confirmed kills, probably many more than that, he fired on it, he shot at it. I mean, he didn't, there was no deliberation, no hesitation, and that's one mm-hmm. of the things that he stressed. Um, that decisive action, you know, is, is very, very important. And so when he, when he saw this object and it didn't have any iron crosses on it and it wasn't recognizable, he fired on it. And the thing went out of control and crashed. Um, they circled around. They saw that the silvery object was not on fire or anything, but it had crashed into a woods in Flanders. It was not occupied by the enemy or anybody. And uh, they saw what looked like two strange beings. They called them ball headed little guys hmm. exit this broken craft. They filed their report. Um, and their superior said, told them that uh, this was strictly confidential, not to be mentioned at all, because what you probably shot down was an American uh, secret weapon of some kind. America at that time was still neutral, and they were doing everything conceivable, to, as I said before, to keep America out of the war. And so they, and so von Richthofen said, gee, I had no idea. That didn't have any markings on it at all, didn't have American flags on it or anything like that said, well, almost certainly the British don't have anything like this, or the French, we don't, so it must be American. And this is something uh, that I found really typically during World War I, whenever these sightings were made, either by Germans or Englishmen or Americans, uh, if they saw a flying disc, even though it didn't resemble anything of of their own, they immediately concluded, oh, it's got to be the enemy, that this is an enemy. No one ever gave a thought that this might be from another world or another time or uh, another species or something like that or extra nobody ever ever thought that they just thought oh it's it's the enemy when they saw the mexican hats well those are our german uh craft and then when the germans saw this thing that or when von richthofen shot it down the report said oh that's an american thing oh. so that's i think that's kind of interesting well it is interesting but at the same time it's before the the tv you know i mean you look at most of what we think and see and theorize and believe, a lot of it is since the TV was invented and, you know, late 40s, which we could go back to the Roswell incident in the late 40s. Well, what you're saying is, of course, people are culturally conditioned these days, and that's correct, we are. And the flying saucer phenomenon is extremely well known, but in 1916, 1917, it was totally unknown. No one ever thought about people living uh, in outer space. That was inconceivable. Just Von Richthofen died about uh, a year, a little more than a year after he knocked down this craft. And then Weisrich, uh, because he had, been, had sworn orders never to divulge this information, uh, never did. And only towards the very end of his long life did he finally tell his family about it. This was back in the late 1990s, and his family took the story to a number of newspapers, and the newspapers just refused to have anything to do with it, hmm. to do it at all. And uh, they finally brought it over to the, the story. No newspaper in Europe would have anything to do with it. They just No one believed it. And uh, so a, a, a newspaper in the United States finally picked it up, and it was a very bad newspaper. It was one of these tabloids. Oh, like your National Enquirer style? Something something like that. And uh, so when I first heard that, along with other UFO investigators, I dismissed it out of hand. But when I got into the particulars of it, I found that there were too many uh, historical rarities, uh, too much information in it that somebody who would have made this up would have never known like the type of the aircraft that von Richthofen flew. Uh, It's assumed that he flew a triplane, a red triplane. Well, he did later, but not at that time. And Weisrick said, we were flying these biplane Halberstadts. Now, that is a very difficult-to-find piece of information. I don't think he would have just thrown that in. That's not the only thing. There were other things. Like, uh, people thought, oh, von Richthofen would have never flown with some uh, neophyte guy that just came out. Well, he used to do that all the time. 
and a lot of other a lot of other details that I mention in the book that suggest they don't prove suggest that this was a true story that it, this actually did happen. I leave it to the reader to really decide one way or the other. Unfortunately, as I say, it's in this tabloid newspaper. But who knows? We might be grateful to that newspaper in the future if this turns out to be true because nobody else would publish it. And the man died, as a matter of fact, uh, Weiserick passed away. He was, oh, I think he was about almost 100 years old. This and is almost like would. the original Roswell. It's kind of like the original Roswell. Yeah, yeah It was yeah. just too, too extreme for people to accept, and, which is so funny, too, because uh, this whole story about UFOs in World War One was too extreme for people to accept that these were were craft from another dimension or on another planet. That was, they just couldn't accept such a thing. So they, they jumped to mundane conclusions, enemy agents. Well, I mean, that's, like you said, that's at the time, they didn't have all the focus of the media on different subjects of that caliber. And I also, uh, I've just read a book and several books, actually, by an author named uh, Paul Von Ward, and he has a great uh, title for what we would call an extraterrestrial such, he calls them ABs, advanced beings. I really like that. Oh, yeah, that, that actually is, you know, that's really the very best description. It's even better than extraterrestrial yeah. because these things may not be from another planet or another world. They may be from another time. So you AB, know. I think, is... Yeah, another dimension. Uh, you know, we get so much uh, reports that they come from the inner Earth, you know, so it's... Who knows? Speaking of inner Earth, uh, piece um, of information that does tend tend to support the uh, von Richthofen uh, story, and that is it, just one week after this happened, supposedly happened in March 1917, March March 17th, 1970. It's one week later. There was a very uh, credible total military. Uh, account that this absolutely did take place. This was at the Portsmouth Naval Yard in New Jersey, uh, in which four GIs, uh, were, were doughboys they were called back then, excuse mm -hmm. me, four doughboys uh, were assigned to guarding a bridge just outside of the Portsmouth Naval Facility. This was uh, just at the time when uh, the United States was ab just about to go to war with Imperial Germany. And these four men guarding the bridge, this was very late at night. It was like about 3.30 in the morning. They were literally uh, attacked, uh, at least in a very aggressive nature, by a bright green light that came out of the, the night sky, early morning sky, and made aggressive moves towards the bridge. They fired on the object, and they, they said the object was close enough for them to get a, draw a bead on it and fire on it, and it flew away, and it just vanished at a terrific speed. Again, made no noise whatsoever. The four men were court-martialed because nobody could believe such a thing mm -hmm. took place. They swore that it did take place. As it turns out, there were other civilians uh, in the general area that had seen something similar, so their court-martial was dropped. However, their testimony was reinvestigated. It was found that the four doughboys were absolutely telling the truth and that this object had actually been seen. Uh, again, it was chalked up as being uh, some kind of an enemy alien aircraft. In 1917, there was nobody, the level of aviation was so low that there was no one in 1917 who was qualified for night flying. There were no lights on airplanes in those days because nobody flew at night. Not only that, the number of aircraft in New Jersey in 1917, you could probably count on the fingers of one hand. And certainly there was, it was not going to fly uh, at, the, at a military bridge installation in the middle of the night. So that is an extremely, excellently, superbly documented That's cool. uh, incident. And I have all of the, the uh, documents for that in the book. I mean, this actually happened. And, and the military records are clear, and they exist. There was another interesting sighting that took place in Texas at um, 
this was in broad daylight, a huge object, kind of resembling uh, a blimp, uh, not a blimp, but a dirigible, and that was thought that, oh, this is oh, an enemy dirigible. <laughs> Dirigibles did not have transatlantic capabilities in 1918, and uh, also it moved at a speed much faster than a dirigible. That was a good uh, sighting as well. That's a very famous sighting, if I'm not, it doesn't even have a name to it, if I'm not mistaken. You know, I forgot it. So yeah, I for sure. It, it, it was fairly well known. What I've been able to do is I, I have based my book entirely, and I don't, I don't mean just uh, occasionally, entirely um, the records that I was able to find, that I was able to transcribe. Well, Some, sometimes these source materials are in newspapers and magazines and books. That's correct. Other times I'm able to go, act, I actually got into the U.S. Navy uh, archives. Anybody can do this. Cool. They have public archives. And there's a lot of great stuff in there. It's unbelievable. Well, hey, while, don't think, why don't we move on to World War II, Frank? I am very interested in those Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters are another example in which combatants on either side uh, assigned these Foo Fighters to the enemy. When the Germans saw them, they thought, oh, they're Anglo-American technology. And then when the Americans saw them, they thought, oh, these are the German jets or something like that. Again, nobody gave a thought to this being from some place. Well, go into a little bit for the listeners of what the Foo Fighters supposedly were. The Foo Fighters were first seen in large numbers. They were seen actually, well, I have to go back just a little bit. And this is an interesting thing. When World War I ended in 1918, all these sightings virtually stopped. There were sightings in the 1920s and 30s, that's correct. But very few. Uh, there was only one military encounter that was with uh, an RAF exercise in England in which uh, there was a, a close confrontation and a dangerous one, but nobody was killed, although the aircraft lost control. And thanks to the skill of the pilot, uh, he was able to regain uh, control of his aircraft. That was a dangerous situation. But other than that, there were very few. World War II came along, and these sightings increased dramatically, especially in 1944. Beginning in 1944, large numbers, and we're talking about large numbers of Foo Fighters, were seen all over uh, the, the Pacific War uh, Theater, uh, the European theater, the North Atlantic, North Africa, Italy, uh, Mediterranean, they were seen a lot. They're, they're called Foo Fighters after the French word foy, for fire. And there was also a comic book uh, character uh, uh, who used to always talk about uh, Foo Fighters. And so it was from this comic book and the French word that the hmm. term Foo Fighter came to be. And the Foo Fighters were mostly, what they mostly did was monitor aircraft, Allied and Axis aircraft. Although there were some, there were a few confrontations in which there were, for the very first time, uh, human beings were killed. And one of the earliest ones was in early 1944. Again, the documents for this are, are clear. They exist. Um, and what happened was that a B-17 was attacked out of a formation, a very large formation of possibly 500 B-17s. This was in 1944 when the mass raids on Europe were taking place. And the B-17 was set on fire, and it fell out of the sky like a comet, and uh, all eight men on board uh, lost their life. Um, that was witnessed by uh, other pilots, other air crews in the area. Uh, the Germans were... Uh, nowhere near close enough to have achieved this. It was not attacked in the normal way. Uh, some kind of, it looked like some kind of confetti uh, fell out of a high altitude, hit the center uh, section of the B-17, the, the aircraft burst into flames and fell out of the sky. Um, there was a confrontation between uh, Japanese and, uh, f and, and uh, UFOs in 1945. So you can see that the uh, the UFO or the aliens were not taking sides. 
and this was over Hokkaido, excuse me, Wonsan, excuse me, not Hokkaido, Wonsan, North Korea, which was occupied by the uh, Imperial Japanese uh, Air Force at that time. Uh, these uh, two uh, very large disks uh, were seen approaching Wusan, Wonsan uh, in early 1945. Uh, J- uh, Japanese interceptors were scrambled and um, they identified they caught up with them because these craft were not going particularly fast. The Japanese fighters caught up with them. Uh, they immediately attacked them. Uh, they knew that they were not Japanese aircraft, so they must be American technology again. That's always the assumption mm-hmm. on the part of uh, pilots in those days. And um, something like a, a, a dogfight ensued, but it was very brief, and one Japanese uh, plane was also set on fire and crashed, and the pilot perished. And the other uh, Japanese aircraft uh, escaped, and the two uh, UFOs um, vanished very quickly after that. One of the UFOs appears to have been damaged by the cannon fire of one of the, one of the uh, Japanese uh, aircraft. So uh, the, uh, the confrontations uh, were sometimes deadly for the first time during World War II, although not on a large scale. Um, and that's, uh, that's primarily what the Foo Fighters were doing, was appear, they appeared to have been monitoring performance. Uh, there was a very famous uh, German test pilot, by the, a, a woman by the name of Hannah Reich. And Hannah Reich was the first uh, person, man or woman, to fly these rocket-powered uh, 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 fighters. And she flew an experimental version of this rocket-powered fighter, which was pretty fast for its day. It was going about, oh, no doubt. about 700 miles an hour when the fastest... Air, uh, piston-driven aircraft was a little more than 400 miles an hour. This thing goes straight up in the air over 700 miles an hour. And while she's taking it on a... Uh, this was in her, her own uh, biography, and she d- describes this test that she pilot, uh, the, this test pilot experience that she had flying the Messerschmitt 163 Comet. And as she's accelerating, going over, a little over 700 miles an hour, this uh, flying saucer came up pretty close to her and went shooting way past her very quickly. And she kind of laughed out loud. She was surprised, but she laughed. She said, well, they were just trying to show us that they, that we think we got some pretty hot stuff here, but it's nowhere near <laughs> as good as, as theirs. It's a lot faster. So, uh, well, that's, was, you know, that's why I brought up the Foo Fighters. I've read, you know, lots of stuff. I guess it's all documented. No one knows what they were, but they definitely were something. Yeah, they were. Uh, they, they're described as pretty much as um, the same sort of uh, UFOs that have been seen. And they, they changed uh, Winston Churchill's perspective on that completely. Um, all during World War II, he had been getting reports about these Foo Fighters being seen from his, his British bomber pilots in the RAF, mostly bomber pilots. And uh, he just dismissed the reports as, well, these men are fatigued or else they're identifying natural phenomena, something else. He just completely dismissed them until this uh, crew of a Wellington bomber. Uh, uh, Wellington was a heavy medium bomber, and the crew had a very harrowing experience, a long experience with one of these objects, uh, which came up very aggressively from the rear. It got very close. They could see that this was a, a luminous disc, and the rear gunner, and the rear gunner was equipped on the Wellington with uh, uh, four uh, 50 caliber machine guns, and that's a lot of firepower. And the rear gunner opened up on this thing at point-blank range and with all four uh, machine guns and um, said that the, 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 uh, the rounds, you could see the, the rounds of the, um, the Wellington um, uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, machine guns just going into this disc. It just seemed like it absorbed them. It had no effect on it whatsoever. And so this disc sort of played cat and mouse with them for some time. They took some superb photographs, supposedly. And um, when they landed, they gave their report. They had to give the report. And Winston Churchill saw the photographs and read the reports, and that changed his mind. And he declared that all other sightings made by the RAF were to be strictly censored and not to be disclosed whatsoever, not even to other um, members of the service. Hmm. Now, is there any German documentation where the German military might have came across this technology? Like, do you think they found any downed UFO craft? 
yes, and that's a long story. <laughs> that, <laughs> and we got time. I, <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't put in the book. Oh. I didn't put it in the book because it would have made the book so much longer. Uh, and I won't go into the whole part of it, but how the Germans got a hold of it, yes, they did. They did get a hold of an object. And this object they got from Italy. It didn't crash in Germany. This was something that happened. I, I'll, I'll make this fast because it's a, a long story. But in 1936, in, in uh, fall of 1936, a rather large flying saucer, I don't know how else to describe it, uh, crashes outside of Milan, Italy. And local people saw it, and they had no idea what this thing was. It didn't make any noise when it crashed. It just, they saw it crash, but it seemed like a, a silent sort of an incident. And the, uh, the fascist uh, authorities uh, immediately uh, surrounded the thing and confiscated it and uh, put it in a uh, hangar. And all of the uh, eyewitnesses to this thing were arrested on Mussolini's personal order. Uh, they were uh, not really arrested. They were put more like in protective custody and uh, interviewed uh, very uh, intensely because he, too, believed that this was an enemy uh, technology. Even though Italy was not at war with anybody at that time, he thought that, well, you know, the war was coming that this was something that the British or the French had. He sent, of all people, uh, Marconi, the inventor of the radio, along with a bunch of other Italian scientists, to investigate this thing. Oh, this, this incident is extremely well documented. Wow. I mean, it overflows with documentation. We've heard almost nothing about it in the United States. This is extremely well known in Italy. The documentation for it, you could uh, you could write just a whole book on, on the uh, source material alone. It's just terrific. Nice. Mussolini clamped down censorship on this thing because he wanted to back uh, reverse uh, engineer uh, this thing. He said, well, the British have made a mistake. They, they uh, crashed their top uh, weapon in Italy. It's ours now, and we're going to uh, back engineer it. We're going to have uh, at least an Air Force equal to theirs. So Marconi, together with these other Italian scientists, studied this thing for a number of weeks. They filed a report to Mussolini saying, this is not British. This is not anything. This comes from some other place. And uh, so then he decided, well, uh, okay, that's, that's probably even better. I want you to back engineer it. We'll have something nobody else has. The uh, scientists, Marconi and the rest of them, they came back and said, we can't figure it out at all have no idea. It, it, it has instrumentalities that we are totally unfamiliar with. In 1937, this is a year later, Hitler came to visit Italy on a state visit. During that state visit, Mussolini said to Hitler, he says, look, we've got this thing here. We cannot figure it out at all. German scientists are very well known. You uh, can, we're not going to let it out of Italy but we're going to put it in northern Italy, and, and your scientists will come over, and they will look at it and try to figure it out, and, and then perhaps we can share the technology that's here. Hitler then sent his scientists down to Moderno, because that's where the craft had been moved, a big hangar outside of Moderno in northern Italy. And the Italians, being what they are, cannot keep secrets <laughs> too well. <laughs> And they even began to write about this thing in their new, own newspapers. And so the, the leaks were all over the place. Um, and the official denial came out. To, oh, no, these are just people are making mistakes. But the story still came out. Um, so the German scientists, and this is typically German, too. The German scientists looked at, well, well of course, we can apply scientific methods here. We will figure it out. And so... They figured, well, this thing must have been powered uh, by something we're only beginning to learn now, and that's uh, jet engines. So they did a, they made a duplication, <laughs> they made a, a, of the of the craft as best they could, and they tried to power it with jet engines. It didn't work at all. It almost, it virtually just self-destructed itself. And the Germans had tried with Italian scientists too. There was a fellow by the name of. Um, uh, uh, Bo, um, Bal Balanzi, 
Galanzi, I think was his name. And then there was another German scientist by the name of Habermal. So Balonzi and Habermal, another German scientist by the name of Mete, or Mete, M-I-E-T-H-E, they worked on this thing all through World War II, and they, they just couldn't uh, figure it out. When the war ended, the machine, the Italian machine, um, was captured by the Americans, and the German mock-up was captured by the Soviets. The Soviets got most of the German scientists. Mite was one of the few scientists who had worked on this flying saucer who got to Canada. And when he got to Canada, he was hired by the Avro uh, uh, Air Aviation Company outside of, inside Toronto. And they said, we want you to make a, a flying saucer version of what you guys were working on a few years ago in World War II. And so he said, well, I don't know what we're going to do for propulsion because the jet engines didn't work. So they said, well, try these new turboprop engines. And so they made a flying saucer. It's, it's called the Avro Car. You can see that. I've heard of that. Yeah, the Avro Car. And it's a flying saucer, and it has these, these ducted fans, and it does not fly well. It flies, but, uh, and it didn't go any further than that. But uh, that is uh, the story that has come out of that, the, the misconceptions, the fantasies, is that the Germans had developed a flying saucer during World War II. That is not true. They did not succeed. Uh, no one has succeeded in back engineering these things. Yeah, that, that we're aware of anyway. No, it doesn't appear because uh, t the reason why they will never be back engineered and have not been back engineered is because they don't have just advanced technology. It would appear that these objects that are found sometimes in relatively good shape, uh, when you get inside, there's nothing in there. Hmm. You'll see some seats, small little seats. You'll see a console and maybe no instruments. Uh, benches, that's another thing that's seen commonly. Uh, virtually no instrumentalities at all. So there has to be some other uh, power source. Yeah, some and other technologies, for it sure. It might be a technology that is based on mental telepathy. I know that's very far out. Uh, if that's the case, and as a matter of fact, some engineers have come to the conclusion that these things can never be back engineered because they're really just shells, that they really are not technology and that they are controlled by some kind of mind control. Or they could be controlled by some kind of like Tesla system, that energy in the air. I mean, Who knows? yeah, we for sure. Know. I mean, uh, but it, it is interesting that in the few cases where there have been reli fairly reliable reports of uh, investigators who have gotten inside these things or have seen uh, their interiors describe them as being virtually barren or empty, and that indicates that they are controlled by something outside rather than inside. Yeah, for sure. Now, weren't there reports around that same time period that there was a secret expedition to Antarctica by the Nazis? I really got into that a lot, and uh, I thought that was a very interesting thing to follow up on. Yes, there was uh, an expedition, uh, a polar expedition, uh, an Arctic expedition by the German Polar Society. It was launched in early 1939, actually late 1938, and it arrived in, uh, in Antarctica at the Ross Ice Shelf in uh, uh, February 1939. One of the early sponsors of the German Polar Society and who, who wanted to go along was Admiral Richard E. Byrd. How about that? And, uh, I've read a lot about Admiral Byrd. <laughs> yeah, that, that can Admiral go pretty Byrd. deep. And Admiral Byrd. Uh, the, uh, Pol the German Polar Expedition uh, was uh, purely a scientific expedition. It's described as a military expedition. It was not. Uh, they had no warcraft, nothing like that. It was mostly, quite honestly, it was mostly a propaganda exercise. Another thing about uh, how great German science is, down the cutting edge of all this stuff. It was, it was kind of a propaganda thing. It was a scientific thing. However, the Germans did see something that they did not expect to see. And uh, it, it uh, disturbed them quite a bit. And we don't know what it was. Uh, we do, uh, we kind of surmise what it was. Uh, the reason I mentioned Richard E. Byrd as being uh, almost part of that expedition is that he saw it off. In 1938, he was a guest of honor in Berlin at the German Polar Society. He spoke at that society. Yeah, I, I, he was, 
thought I remember that, that they had asked him to come along. They had asked him to come along, and he said he would love to go along, uh, but he couldn't because relations between his country and theirs was so bad that it would not be possible, and that um, unless uh, relations improved, that he, he just would not be possible for him to do that. After World War II, the man that was in charge of the German polar expedition, his name was Karl Richtler, R R I T C H L E R, and uh, he was a captain in the German Navy. He was in charge of that. This this story it, it gets so bizarre. It gets it is it, <laughs> it, it's very bizarre. But it's not hearsay. It's not theory. It's documented. Richler survived World War II. How a German officer could have gotten from occupied Germany in 1945, I think, for 40, yes, for 1945, the war is just over, something like summer or, or uh, early fall of 1945, he was able to leave Germany and come to the United States and meet with Admiral Byrd. How that happened, channels or people knew each other, I don't know how that happened, but, but Richtler told his friend, told Admiral Byrd, that they had seen some disturbing things in Antarctica. That was very confidential. That they, they had they never went back. Uh, the Germans didn't have a, a UFO base. The Germans didn't have any base in Antarctica. I found out they had none. They had nothing. They did have an, uh, a base in the North Pole in the Arctic. That's for sure. It was a radio uh, monitoring base. It was a, uh, an advanced weather station, a meteorological station. It was very important to the war effort against Russia. But the Germans had nothing after 1939 in Antarctica. And the reason why was they didn't have the resources. They, they were not flush with cash like uh, the Americans. They had very limited military naval resources. And they, they just didn't have the manpower or the or the equipment, or, or even the interest, really. The war was nowhere near Antarctica. It was, not a, it was not a theater of the war at all. So the Germans never went back. Another story about a German base there is just total fantasy. I, I can tell you for a fact. But nonetheless, the Germans did see, did encounter something that upset them very badly in 1930. And what was that? A base. <laughs> Apparently, they photographed a base. Oh. They had two uh, aircraft, long range. They brought two long range aircraft. These were super, superb aircraft. They were Dornier uh, flying boats, and they were had great uh, uh, range capabilities. And they were very stable platforms, ideal for making films. And the Germans did make a feature film about their polar expedition. Another strange story. I've I've actually seen a a copy of some of that. Some of it. You bet. Some so, of it. so did this lead to Admiral Byrd's um, official expedition that he did himself with the Navy? You got it. That was Operation High Jump, correct? Operation High Jump. The Germans had were making this photographic record of Antarctica, of, of areas that had never been seen before of Antarctica, and that's true. That's uh, even people that are hostile to the whole idea admit that the German polar expedition of 1939 um, was able to photograph large areas of Antarctica that had never been seen by human beings before. And in this one area, they apparently photographed uh, a base. And they had photographic evidence, proof of it. This evidence was shared. Richler was sworn to secrecy uh, by his superiors in the Navy during World War II, but Germany was totally defeated and the superiors were all dead or in prison. It didn't make any difference anymore. And so Richler said something should be carried on about this, and he apparently said, hey, he went to the Allies and said, I know Admiral Byrd uh, personally. Call him and tell him, tell him I'm still here and I want to meet him. And that's probably exactly, I'm assuming that's what happened, but I think that that's what happened. And the Allies, uh, the occupation authorities, called up Admiral Byrd and said, hey, there's this crazy German over here, and he <laughs> says he knows you, and he's got some pictures he wants to show you from Antarctica. And, well, what's his name? It's his name. Carl Richner, get him over here right away. And I think that's exactly what happened. I don't see how it's possible that, a, like, say, a German in 1945 could have gotten him oh, passage. It was an admiral. I mean, my guy, Bird, so, Bird was an admiral. He was an extremely prestigious man. He had a lot of influence in the 
American military, especially the Navy. He was very famous. Uh, his word was virtually law in the Navy. And so when, um, when Richler conferred with uh, uh, Admiral Byrd and showed him the photographs, Admiral Byrd was extremely alarmed. And only a man of his authority could have done what happened in 1946. In night, be between mid-1945 and the years immediately after World War II, all of the world was disarming. Russia was gone as far as the military power, was in ruins mostly. Europe was in ruins. Japan was wrecked. Uh, all of Europe was down the drain. The only power was America. And so we were, at that time, canning in our military. We were beating our, our swords into plowshares, literally. <laughs> we were in massive disarmament. There was no need for it anymore. We thought. <laughs> we thought. Admiral Bur and this is the insane part of it, something only of this magnitude could have been responsible for what happened. In 1946, Admiral Byrd, on, on his own, to his own influence, arranged an armada. He collected an armada of a naval, not an expeditionary force, on invasion, a military invasion of a massive aircraft carrier that included hundreds and hundreds of air personnel, the latest aircraft, the first U.S. helicopters, cruisers, submarines, uh, uh, electronic um, uh, communications vessel that was state-of-the-art, that had even, hadn't even been uh, gotten at sea trials yet, destroyers, destroyer escorts, an armada. There was like 50 to 150 ships, correct? It was gigantic. And it was insane because there was nobody to invade. And what did he do with this? He invaded Antarctica. Unbelievable. Antarctica, no, nobody's there but penguins. Which is crazy, too, because nowadays, isn't it like the South Pole area a no-fly zone? It, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And he called it Operation High Jump. Well, the U.S. Navy put out, well, this is a scientific expedition. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's, Admiral Byrd was an honest guy. Uh, and he, he had a hard time keeping a secret, especially important stuff. So the U.S. Navy had put out for months in advance that, yes, we're going to have, the U.S. Navy is going to have a, uh, a naval exercise, a, sci a purely scientific expedition to the, the South Pole. And so this expedition is getting ready in New York. That's a big send-off. No secret at all. And Admiral Byrd uh, has a press conference. And at the press conference, uh, somebody, <laughs> brings, uh, I think maybe even at the New York Times, is a major newspaper, said, well, Admiral Byrd, uh, you're going down there for the scientific expedition, but why do you need an aircraft carrier and all these armed fighter planes and bombers and seaplanes and everything and he said because it's a military expedition <laughs> and the, his own advisor at that time cut him off and said well it's a military it's a scientific expedition actually that's supervised by the military <laughs> end of the press conference so this military expedition takes off flag flying they had along with them uh, 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 an aircraft that was totally unsuited for uh, scientific purposes because it was a big bomber. It was called the, uh, the Mariner, the Martin Mariner. It was a gigantic flying boat. could carry something like about 800 pounds of high explosives. was armed to the teeth, and they had several of these, along with the aircraft carrier. And they, it was a huge task force and that's exactly what it was a military task force they they had put out that they were going to be down there for eight months doing scientific testing of all kinds they returned after less than two months and when they returned they did not return with all of their men and all of their ships and all of their planes that task force limped 
into Valparaiso, Chile. The task force was so badly beat up that it couldn't even steer for home waters. Mm. That some of the men were in such bad shape, so many men were in bad shape, that they could not be attended to by the medics on board their own ships and had to be given to Chilean hospitals. And much of this is documented also. The whole thing is documented. The whole thing is there. All you have to do is, uh, I, when I first, I heard a little bit about this, I thought, oh, this is just a nonsense. And one thing you can do is you can go to the horse's mouth. Go to the U.S. Navy archives, public archives, and type in Operation High Jump. Now, and was Bird on the ship that returned, or was he missing Yes, he time? was on the ship. He was, And he gave a newspaper interview. Uh, which, of course, was uh, the U.S. Navy's nightmare for him <laughs> to do that. He gave a newspaper interview with Chile's leading newspaper. Not only was this Chile's leading newspaper, it's called El Mercurio, still is in publication. It's one of the oldest newspapers in the world. Not only is El Mercurio uh, the leading Chilean newspaper, it's the leading Spanish-speaking newspaper in the world. Wow. It's read around the world. And to this major newspaper, El Mercurio, Admiral Byrd was asked some pretty hard questions. And one of the questions was, oh, why, uh, why did you, uh, why are you stopping in Valparaiso? And he said, we had to put in for repairs. And they said, well, as far as we know, there were no major storms in there, in, in the Arctic Sea at the time. No, we, saw where we have losses. And we have to, um, we have, we were inadequate to staff to take care of our men. And he, and he was asked, well, what caused this? And Admiral Byrd, and you can read this yourself. I quote him directly. He says, I don't mean to alarm any of your readers or anyone at all, but nonetheless, we are in a very dangerous, we, meaning the world, is in a very dangerous situation. Because right now, which is insane, because in 1946, the world was in ruins. Nobody was a danger to anybody. Wow. Well, we're going to have to end it about right now, Frank. Okay. What is the name of that new book? How can you find it? How can they find you? Okay. The name of the book is called Military Encounters with Extraterrestrials, and they can get copies at Amazon.com. I'm going to be speaking about this book at something called the uh, Alien Expo. That's going to be in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, on um, August 17th. And anybody that's interested in that, all they have to do is uh, go on their computer and the Internet and AlienExpo.com, and it tells all about a lot about my book and uh, what I'm going to be talking about. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us, Frank. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing this information. It's uh, pretty interesting stuff. Yes, yes, it's unique stuff, and we enjoyed it very much. Hopefully our listeners do, too. And I am Bruce Cunningham. And I'm Rodney McGilvery. And this, this has been, been Ancient, Ancient Mysteries, Mysteries Revisited. Revisited.